Central South. Anybody from Zone 4? Let's go to CWZ Zone 5. So, Ron, I'll, I'll be happy to start. I uh, have a concern, actually, in the guidance. So, in the guidance, they created, um, or they reference uh, the Kentucky Department of Education's uh, room capacity calculator. And I was pretty excited and measured all our gyms and uh, created a spreadsheet. And I, th I think it was forwarded, uh, actually, to some of you who saw it. But um, I, don't think it, I don't think it's accurate. <laughs> And uh, we, I worked with a colleague yesterday um, uh, and just found some, some issues with it. And I, and I think it's, so you, you measure square footage, length times width, and then you simply do the math to create the 12 by 12 circles um, in a ratio. And um, I, I, I think the core of the issue when using that calculator is that <clears throat> It treats all space the same, and in a in a rectangle or a square, you can essentially have you you don't have to account for distance away from the wall. So if we think in phys ed terms, we we don't line kids aren't like up against the wall, lined up, and that that has an effect on that calculator. Um, I don't know. I I spent most of the day yesterday working through that and and. I, I don't know if anybody else has used it or tried to delve into it. Um, Chris, I, there's in that calculator, there's a place where you can uh, put in the percentage or capacity. So yep. you got to try to account for that and say like, are out of this rectangle, only 75% of it is usable space. And then it should account for those, those buffers. Yeah, we, we did that. We did, we went down from a hundred to 75 and the, and the number, it's pretty conservative still still is really make, restrictive so make the rectangle six feet smaller if depending on how yeah. big you want the buffer right yeah yeah i just um i i guess i struggled with it because like that was directly in the guidance and and i i, I worry people are using it so we've we've just adjusted and like almost made it like 60 percent of the space um but uh i don't know i i I want people to be aware. aware and oh, Chris, is it wrong to take the square footage of your gym and divide by 144? 12 by 12? Yeah, that's what, I, that's, what I, that's what I think Tam and Steve are getting to. And even the calculator like allows for the usable space. We have to account that space near a wall is not usable. That makes sense. Like they could be three feet away from the wall and twelve feet away from everybody else in aerobic activity, but um, that has to account. So, uh, Dewey just included a calculator in the chat that I appreciate you making. I'll definitely use. So. Hey, can I ask a question about the twelve foot rule in general? Because you know, around here in Section Six, we're at, we have different interpretations. Some people feel that is purely any phys ed class has to be 12 feet. Some people are interpreting it as aerobic activity. So if you're doing cup stacking, table tennis, uh, something of that nature, do you have to be 12 feet? And I can't get any, any good guidance on that. I would agree. It's, it, you know, when they're sitting still, it's six feet. When they're moving, it's 12 feet. Or if they're blowing into any instruments or whatever, right. it's 12 feet. But I mean, if they're doing yoga, they're in the gym on mats doing yoga, uh, for instance, or table tennis, do we have to be, cons I mean, table tennis would have to be singles, but it'd be at least six feet apart there. What's the consensus on that? Jason, I really think that the 12 feet is for aerobic activity. And I think the six feet uh, is for non-aerobic activity. I will also tell you, I think everybody's going to, from what I understand, everybody's going to be wearing masks no matter what you're doing right. um, in, 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 the, in phys ed. So, well, that's um, what I wonder about the aerobic activity. You know, if you're wearing a mask, are we really going to be pushing kids to do a great deal of aerobic um, type of work with masks mm -hmm. on? Okay, thanks. We're going, we're going the same thing. Six if, you're, if it's regular and 12 if it's aerobic. Thanks, Tam. 
when I talked to uh, <clears throat> Colleen Corsi yesterday and um, every, it was the same thing, 12 foot roll book, six foot stationary. So that's, that's the guidance I got. I talked to Clancy to see more. That's the information I received. Great. Yeah, the other concern is that, you know, with the mass designed for aerobic activity. Um, the, only, the only one that's designed for aerobic activity is the U2 mask, and that's impossible to get. Um, so that brings up other concerns if kids are going to be wearing masks during our aerobic activity. And you have to watch for kids to be fainting and so on. When, when COVID first hit in China, I think it was China, we, we uh, started schools. That actually happened in their phys ed classes. Kids wearing masks went down. So, you know, we need to be aware of who has asthma, who has breathing difficulties. And, and just like in your schools, I, I would imagine there's going to be exceptions. We're going to have exceptions of kids wearing masks in our schools based on medical needs. I would imagine that would be no different in phys ed. Well, I think, too, is you're going, if you're running an aerobic activity, you may have built-in breaks to just to monitor students. You know, you may not go for long periods of time. So the teaching can be somewhat different than what we've experienced in the past. Anybody else? Let's go keep with uh, Zone 5, CWZ. I'll jump in. This is Mike Giretti from Hilton Central. How's everyone doing today? So I, I think there's a couple things we're talking about here. One, your district's going to have the approach, you know, probably of being so much more conservative. Obviously, this could be our first time that our kids are back physically within our building since March 13th. So then from a physical education standpoint, while we're having discussions in our district, um, we, we are going to be presenting a hybrid, uh, meaning... K-12, kids will be in school either a Monday, Thursday, one cohort, or a Tuesday, Friday, one cohort, and then there'll also be some distance learning. So we're having discussions about professional development opportunities for our teaching staff uh, in those two prongs, like what will social distancing, physical education look like? We are beginning absolutely with 12 feet. We're being more conservative regardless of activity with masking. We're utilizing the outdoors early on. So our goal, we believe outdoors is our friend. So when we start, because the beginning point will be extremely important in our opinion. So we're looking at PD opportunities that we're looking to design for our staff to be able to incorporate individualized activities focused on health-related fitness with no equipment to start with. We figure that cleaning, that sharing, all those things, we want to get our feet under us as we begin the year uh, with physical education. So we're going to look at PD opportunities with that. And then how do we match the virtual piece, the distance piece with the learning? So we're going to look at, um, you know, professional development opportunities for our staff there. We're also, we're offering the opportunity for families that that choose to, to do only distance learning. So then we also got to make sure we have PD for our staff, for those that are just with distance. Now, we learned through those three months of March, April, May, and June, four months, whatever, of what worked, what didn't, and we had an ongoing list of adjustments and things of that nature. Um, but really, our challenge, I see it as getting our, our staff, and we have your year one teacher to your year 31 teacher of, you know, we got about 19 of them, how we're going to hopefully give them the, the tools to work with our kids to begin with. But our, our thought process is being very conservative, regardless of activity. Yeah, it talks about, you know, cardiovascular, if you're moving 12 feet or six feet, but we're, we believe in being conservative because we also don't want you know, and we're going to have positive cases. Um, you know, we don't want that coming from, and all of a sudden, well, in phys ed, they were six feet and, you know, what have you. So our goal and what I'm looking for resources, really, um, from this group and holistically is how can I help our teachers be prepared? Our kids don't start physically coming into school till Friday, September 11th, if our plan goes forward. I want to help our staff be ready because they're going to be nervous. They're going to be trying to figure out 
you know, what works, what doesn't. And that's why our, we started even in um, April, May, and June, we were meeting um, weekly, all staff, and we were started to really brainstorm at that point, individualized activities, distance, potentially, we didn't talk about masks, but potentially with masks, how can we, and then there's that social emotional learning. Our kids need some contact with our staff, so we talked about the leadership. We're actually, I, mean, I'm going on, I apologize. So looking for resources. If we could have a resource bank, I love the document the New York State AFER put together. I've already forwarded that to our staff, um, but looking for resources. So two, two great points you make that, that I want to uh, make sure we're all thinking about as directors. Number one, our staff is going to be nervous, so we're going to have to really help them stand in front of kids and you, you, you want to you don't want to be so tight where all of a sudden kids are going well, what do you mean i don't feel safe now we want to make sure kids feel comfortable even in that 12 feet so we got to coach our teachers to make sure that they're not making it so uh restrictive that kids feel like it's not safe so that's an important thing i think because kids will feel the same way and then the other piece you mentioned was what you learned during the three months and the, the other thing all of us should be focused on is um the fact that this beginning is different than March. March was survival mode. This beginning, we're required to provide new instruction. We're required to provide synchronous learning, although that may not look differently in phys ed. So you brought up two really good points. And, and I'm with Mike in terms of uh, when we get to the part of the agenda on the virtual resources, and I wanna hear from people what you're using and what works so I can share that with my staff. So uh, good points there. Mike, thank you. Let's continue with um, Central Western Zone. If I could, if I could step in, um, I'll give credit to Brian Donahue. He had an idea, and I, I think, as we end this meeting, we've we've got to create whether it's by zone or statewide, but have our phys ed teachers zoom in with each other, and and have these conversations throughout throughout different districts, because um, I I think that's going to be helpful for them. Um, but one thing I really want to get out of this meeting is online resources. Um, I, I want to be prepared for virtual instruction. That's that's probably where we're going to be headed. Just my hunch, um, as we move forward with cold and flu season, and I'm I'm looking for something K through 12. I I haven't found anything of of value really. I've got some phys ed teachers looking. Mm -hmm. to, so if if anybody has any online um, supplemental um, programs, CDs, anything, I would be interested in in uh, getting the vendors of that. Thanks. You know, we don't, I don't know that I have the, the online program like that, but I was in a, a seminar yesterday and they talked about the regular and substantive interaction model, an RSI model, and they use it in, um, it's my understanding from the presentation is they use it in um, secondary distance learning right now. And it was good because it, it talked about um, the instructor initiates the, the instruction. So it's not you post an assignment and then the, and a resource and the kids go do it. So it was instructor initiated. And then it talked about how you evaluate what you wanna teach and should it be asynchronous or should it be synchronous? There are some different things. And so, and it, um, and, and it talked about how do you change your instruction based on how the kids are responding. So I think that's a framework. I was really frustrated last year. All our, all our teachers are good at Google, they can do it. But I felt like it was put it up on a bulletin board and the kids go do it. I didn't feel like there was enough of the interactions and enough smart decisions about what should be asynchronous and what shouldn't be. So I think that RSI model is a place, a thing that I'm gonna investigate a little bit more. And it's not to your point about a, a canned curriculum, but it's a, an approach to distance learning. Pamela, can you put that in the chat? Do you have a link to that? I don't have a link. I just uh, learned about it yesterday and I'm going to go research it myself. It's awesome. called uh, Regular and Substantive uh, interaction, RSI. If we do one of those shared things and I do look it up, I can put it in there. Thank you. Let's continue. Ronnie, I, five. I, yeah, go ahead. I got a question for the group. I heard as an example of, an, of if, if we are in person in some capacity, I heard an example of table tennis. I'm just curious as to what people's plans are to if I go to that class and I'm going to use a paddle, I'm going to use a ball and I'm done with it and I got another class coming in in 10 minutes, what people's plans are to disinfect that so that we can have multiple users. I don't know if people, I mean, one of my thoughts was to wear gloves. I believe I've got permission from our grounds and our 
in our district to do so. But I'm just curious as to what people's thoughts are if we do put equipment in people's hands. I know oh, we're talking, go ahead. Go ahead, Kim. We're talking about doing some kind of themed instruction. I, we do have one of those zappers that Jim has at, at each building, so we could use that potentially. But we're talking about themed instruction. So like for the day, we'd have a theme of throwing and the first class would use a football and the second class would use a Frisbee and the third class would use so that we could divide it up so we'd have six sets of equipment and then not worry about that disinfectant piece until the end. And that's just a thought we've had. We don't know if it's gonna work, but that's because we didn't know what to do about that equipment stuff either. So that's our thought right now. That is a great idea. So I love this COA meeting. I never even would have thought of that. That's a great idea. <laughs> so one of the things that, um, oh, go ahead, Jesse. Uh, sometimes I have uh, audio issues down here, so I hope I'm coming through clear. You're good. Um, one of the things we've talked about doing at Hastings is creating some type of package or expectations for, for students to bring along with them. Um, we're not quite sure how we'll manage it. Certain items like a simple PVC piping uh, or TheraBand that students will bring with them to each class. I think we're focused in on the first few weeks at least similar to some of you on some of the personal fitness uh, concepts to try to keep our exposure pretty minimal and to start to learn a little bit better in real time how to manage our spacing and everything else. But one of the things we've talked about with our PTSA and our education foundation is providing these tiny little care packages of fitness equipment for each student in the district. And it seemed to have gathered a little bit of support from our um, PTSA and some other groups. If I, if I could jump in, Todd, um, one of the things that uh, we are doing in Clarence is we have purchased foggers, misting, disinfecting uh, apparatuses, and um, we are actually making our own disinfectant, and the disinfectant that we are putting together will kill everything in about two minutes. And so we're looking, obviously, at, at maximum risk reduction to elimination. So we would, if we were going to use table tennis or golf or um, tennis, you know, we would be looking at some kind of really small cohort. So if you're playing doubles tennis, you stay with the same kids. Um, you share a tennis, three tennis balls each, and, um, you know, re you reduce the risk of, of, of spreading things out. And, um, you know, at the end of every period, um, teachers can, and this is a, a union issue, obviously, you know, the union saying you cannot share any equipment, don't do any kind of cleaning. Um, but a lot of our teachers are like, you know what, this is going to make my job easier and uh, it makes sense for the kids and so on. Um, so that's going to be an option uh, that, that we'll look at using. Thanks, Jason. Let's continue zone five. Ron, if, if I could just add in another thought, I, I said this in a meeting, a local meeting, and no one really applauded me for it, so I'm not sure if it's if it's a good idea or not, but our, our teachers did. Standard three, resource management. Uh, we talked about having the kids clean their equipment after they're done. Um, we do it in the weight room, and why wouldn't we do it for a tennis racket or, or a piece of PVC piping? sort of like the theory of blood and I'm not sure if that's the same theory that when uh, you have um, a victim with bleeding etc what do you always ask them to put on gloves and to take care of their own so you can minimize it I I'm not sure what what's the group think I love the idea our attorneys told us we can't have kids cleaning right Anybody else, Mr. Rones from five? So uh, in Penyan, we're fortunate enough to um, have the ability to hopefully bring everybody back uh, after two weeks. Um, and we're not as concerned of our children are getting it and passing it to each other. We're really kind of concerned about staff to staff, um, which I think, you know, all the indicators show that 
you know, in our Yates County, we've had 50 cases. I know that seems pretty ludicrous to a lot of you that that's, you know, the only cases that we've had. None of them have been children. Um, so we're not really too concerned with children passing this. We're really kind of concerned with our adults and our staff um, that that's what's going to be doing it. So if we have our staff then cleaning down everything, we got to make sure that they're being really cautious um, and that they're wearing their mask and they're really protecting themselves. So I don't know if anybody already has, you know, any other concerns about that because I think that's where our, our, our most of our uh, onus needs to be because these kids are already getting together. They're already doing those things. So I'm not really as concerned about them spreading everything. I'm concerned about the staff getting it. Anybody else? Central Western Zone. <clears throat> then let's go to Western Zone, Zone 6. Um, I'll jump on there. I don't know if any other directors are on from Western Zone. Um, so, you know, I think Mike said it, you know, we're really looking at outdoor heavy. Um, our units that we've kind of adapted or, or golf and, and tennis, um, a walking unit. Um, one of the things that as I've been going through the schedule, I noticed the way we're doing our hybrid split, our kids will see um, an in, 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 in person is that experience one time a week and in some cases it would be a Monday the first week and then a Thursday the next week so one of the things that I'm looking at is typically our, our units are seven classes you know and we can stretch this a little bit I, I think is is one of the outcomes that you know you have to think about like okay they're actually gonna be in class you know three times in a typical unit you know what does a tennis or a golf unit look like in, in person right um, so I, I think that the duration of our units will be a little bit longer. Um, obviously, rainy days are challenges because you're going inside, you have the spacing issue. Um, we are taking the approach to anything, um, you know, anaerobic would be six foot, 12 foot for anything aerobic. But that's, if you're doing something aerobic, it's hard to really control that because that means kids are moving a lot. You know, so we're looking at, at things like, you know, a unit of just doing some kind of, um, Type of workout or yoga in the gym or even in the in the bleachers in the pool doing a, a content-based lesson on on fitness concepts um, you know we also have uh, line dancing as a potential thing that we can spread kids out and kind of keep them somewhat stationary um, can jam um, badminton perhaps pickleball you know kind of in a singles type thing those we have to kind of play out, but we're kind of planning this indoor thing through January. Um, you know, swimming, I, I think is off the table. We're not having the kids change for PE. Um, we just start keeping them out of the locker room. We're doing activities they can do it in their clothes. It's an expectation they bring sneakers if they're not wearing sneakers. Um, so those are a couple of things. I already mentioned our equipment uh, strategy. Um, not sure how that's gonna work, but um, you know, that, that's one of the models. Again, it's risk reduction. You know, we can't eliminate kids from touching doorknobs, bathrooms, you know, things throughout the school. So, you know, we have to concede a little bit of using some level of reasonability. Uh, virtually, we're, we use Schoology as a platform. Our teachers are working hard this summer on uh, understanding that. Our secondary group has kind of already been using it a little bit, and they will use some kind of content-driven asynchronous lessons because when we're in person, um, you know they're going to see they're going to see the kids one day a week and then asynchronous another day or two in a week. Um, our district is is asking our classroom teachers to stream their class. We can't do that. We're not going to strap GoPros on our teachers and you know have them doing all kinds of crazy things. So they they've you know are, are allowing us as long as the kids log in to Schoology, which we can check attendance and meet that requirement on the day they're supposed to be asynchronous. Um, you know, we will give them some kind of either video to evaluate, uh, study guide to, you know, read through, answer some questions on Schoology, get some kind of uh, checks for understanding, even some grade, uh, graded pieces there. Um, because that's, I think, for our high school, probably the biggest thing. They're kind of participation heavy in grades, and this is going to force them to do a little bit, you know, change in their grading structure a little bit uh, with the asynchronous piece. Jason, let me jump in there that you make a great point. A lot of us are going to be in that boat where we're going to have to supplement our instruction 
asynchronously. asynchronously. Uh, so is anybody using any good tools? We use Schoology as well, but I know Flipgrid is out there. Is anybody using any good tools that kids could be engaged at home, not synchronous, and so not at the same time as a phys ed class, but to supplement what's going on or, or to pre-learn the skill so that when they do come in, they're performing the skill. Anybody aware of any good tools? I've heard about, and, and I don't know them, that I'm just starting down this road, uh, Flipgrid, yep. Hammy, and um, there was another one, See, Seesaw? Seesaw. Yeah, so I don't know this stuff, and and I think it matters. Like I went first to my tech guys because uh, we found out last year we were supporting too much as a district, so they're going to limit us to certain things. So that was my first stop was to say, okay, what are we supporting? But I think once you figure it out, there's already some stuff there in the district. We just got to use it. Some of the feedback we got from our parents and community from the spring was there again too many platforms. So our district is utilizing Google Classroom as a sole source and then using some supplemental things on top of that. I still uh, using the Glide app from Jim Wright uh, for our physical education and health programs in the spring. It worked really well for us, but we're going away from that because we're unifying our approach. Yeah, Penyon's the same way. We're just doing Google Platform because it was too difficult for families who had kids in elementary school and maybe the middle school and everybody's using a different program and platform and to sign on. So it's just Google Platform. One of the things that we did uh, last spring was, and we're on Schoology, is we gave, and this was new for us, we gave rights to all of our parents to view everything through Schoology to help encourage their participation in completing the work. And we had a dramatic increase in students that were completing work, especially at the younger levels. Uh, so if your district hasn't already done that, that would be a good tip to get more involved in the Have you thought about, this is a group question, anything about grading or is it something that is not on the radar now you don't want to get into? What about grading? Not on the radar. We had, we had some discussion. We're continuing as is, even with the hybrid, with both the in-person and distance learning. We're as is across all subject areas. We're having discussion because we're allowing, like I said earlier, those families that want to choose to just do distance learning, what that'll look like. And we've had some preliminary discussions of shifting our grading practice um, for those virtual learners that we never see. But it's, it's very preliminary. Just gonna give my two cents here. I think, and, and I said it before, what's different than in the spring is that uh, we're required to provide new instruction and part of that to me is, is assessing kids and, and holding them accountable for gaining the knowledge, however we decide to live, deliver it. And um, anything less than that, I think would be a disservice to what could hurt us in terms of, a, of a content area. You know, I think we really need to think about that and say to our, you know, we might help our teachers, support our teachers and how are you teaching kids? How are you assessing them? How do you know they're getting the knowledge? What are you doing if they're not? Just like we would if, if we were live. So uh, I think that's gonna be really important for us because I know a lot of us, you know, when we got to the spring, some of us went right to activity logs at the secondary level. And activity logs are great and got us through, but that's not that's not a solid instructional practice over time. So um, just my two cents. Yeah, if I could add to the grading conversation, like I said, it's kind of an interesting opportunity to get people to think a little bit out of the box. So, you know, I, I, so I sat on the New York City for an online forum that they did uh, with a guy from West Virginia, which was really good. And he talked about, you know, kids creating GIFs, which are looping small segments of videos where they could, you know, analyze a throw, they could, you know, do some, some analytic type work. There's videos that they could post of, of them doing uh, workouts. The Schoology platform allows you, and you could do this through Google Forms as well, um, to do, you know, little checks for understanding where, you, you know, you have, have the kids read or watch some kind of video and ask them some questions about strategy, about you know personal social responsibility and sportsmanship. You know what did you observe in this in this video? So um, although it may not align exactly with whatever unit they are doing um, in person, uh, I mean you could certainly do that. Um, but I think our teachers really need, and we have to help give them some ideas because um, they haven't done this before. Um, you know 
I taught in the classroom for a long time as a health teacher, and it's a different style of teaching. If all you've done is phys ed, you don't think about creating a thought prompt, for instance. You know, I ask them to watch this video, and what, what do you have them just simply respond with, what does this make you think about in terms of uh, sportsmanship and things of that nature? So there's a lot we could do with Schoology or Google Forms, which are probably the two biggest uh, platforms people are using um, to get some feedback from kids. Um, you could do logs that way as well and, and be able to comment on them. Um, but I think the grading piece, you know, you're gonna have to think about before you start and be very clear with the kids what the expectations are and what the grades are gonna look like. Because I think Brian's right, most places were some kind of pass fail, you know, build the plane when it's in the air, you know, let's get through it. Um, now I think districts have a, a greater expectation for us. And, and I think it's a great opportunity, to be honest with you, to get them to think about uh, fitness concepts, you know, any, any number of things that um, are not typically in our psychomotor domain. So just to jump on that a little bit, uh, Jason, uh, we did something similar as well in the springtime where we had um, our middle school physical education department had uh, students submitting videos after the teacher submitted a video. Um, you know, they, they taught them some skills. They had some other resources for them um, to be able to uh, digest. And then they had to return a video um, with their interpretation of it. And they had to actually show um, some form and everything. One of the, the difficult things is feedback, timely feedback um, is that if you have you know 200 students and you have 200 videos coming in uh, it's going to take a lot of time to to be able to give that feedback and our district said if you can't give 24-hour feedback then you're not giving the right kind of assessment so um, using more of the forms google forms is we'll, we'll try to get some better feedback that way and just on a little different note i don't know if any other school districts are in um, the same boat we are but we have to have um, accessibility um, before accountability. So we have a difficult time. We have dead zones in our area where we do not have high quality, um, high speed internet for our students. So if we can't get them accessibility, we cannot hold them accountable if we're in the full digital learning platform. Good comment. I'm gonna go right to zone seven, Northern zone. about eight Nassau zone. I'll go nine and 10 Catskill and Suffolk zone. Catskill or Suffolk. So we- Good morning we everyone, can everyone hear me? This is Kermit Moyer from the Ellenville district. How are you? Kermit. Um, so with everything that's been shared already from the previous directors, um, I'm right on board with everything that you're saying. Um, specifically here in our area and in Ellenville, um, we're a very high needs, aid dependent district. I think Matt brought light to it for me as well. We have an accessibility issue too with the uh, internet and uh, how many kids are engaging remotely. So that's one of our biggest concerns. Um, also in working with my staff uh, right now, we are um, thinking about that accountability piece and what what assessments are gonna look like and how we're gonna grade and assess students. So uh, similar to what everybody else has said. Um, our plan is a K-6 model that's gonna be on an A-B cohort, uh, week one week at a time. So co cohort A will come in one week and then cohort B with the expectation that students are remotely engaging if they're home and they're in a, in a different cohort. The second thing is our 712 students are all remote learning at this point. Uh, so that's the decision we're making based on our, uh, our, our staffing concerns, our facilities, and, and what we can offer. So that's where we're at. our board just approved ours this morning at a special meeting. So hopefully we'll see what the state does with it. Uh, but those are some things that we're thinking about. And um, similar to what Mike Geruzzi said, a, a lot of individual type activities and trying to meet that 12 foot spacing. And again, uh, the outdoors uh, will be our friend for us as well. So thanks for letting me uh, chime in and share, and uh, it's good to see everyone. Thanks, Kermit. I've got we New just, York City Zone, or anybody else would like to contribute. We, we decided to buy 6,000 bubbles for the kids to, uh, to pass around <laughs> there. So nice, nice big bubbles. Now, in, in, it's, it's all different down here, obviously. You know, we could have a cohort of schools within our BOCES that they're all making independent decisions on how they're going to do it. So what happens is the flavor of the month looks good for this one. Parents see what they're doing and want us to do it, but physically we can't, so someone else can. So
So this is this is what's happening here, and these are all great ideas. The only thing that we might be doing a little bit differently is, and, and one thing I'd argue the fact is, you know, we're talking about playing tennis and ping pong and throwing football around. Hey, guys, we, we can't even get out and play tennis now. You know, so the logic of assumption that we're going to be in a fitness mode or a yoga mode or a Pilates mode to begin with is where we all should be right now. Because I really think the fact that cleaning equipment takes up more time and gets away from what we're trying to do. So we're not approaching that at all. So what we're going to be doing here is the kids will get a QR code when they come in, those that are coming into school. We have half coming in, the whole district. That's our model. Um, but this is for the upper grades. The lower grades is going to be a little bit different. Kids will get a QR code. They'll take the picture. If they all have Chromebooks, they can use that as well. They'll get a contextual article. They'll get a Google form to fill out. They'll have a, mod a moderate physical activity to perform, whether it's walking, whether it's yoga, whether it's stretching, whether it's something like that, and then a reflection piece at the end. So this way we can at least have some accountability for the kids to do what they need to do. Now, I'm heavy Hispanic, so these will all be in English and Spanish uh, for what we have to do. And we're set to go with that. And I appreciate someone bringing up the app before. That was just some something to get us through. I, I still feel that whatever – can go in and be global. And I like Ron's idea of, of before about saying something that's global. I think Jimmy even said it too. If there's something that we can actually develop where we all can use one thing in one place, it seems to have a better effect on us when someone says, hey, how come you're not doing that? And whether there's a physical capability or, or incapability to do things. So the, Listen, we, you know, we're all in the same boat. We're, we're all in the same boat rowing. We're just in different seas right now, and and that's how we're kind of looking at it. But I appreciate all the all the ideas. I mean, Scology is is seems to be a very good platform. Seesaw is also a very good platform to use, and we're going to be giving PD on those as well. So, thank you for giving me the time to speak. Thanks, Jim. Uh, can I say something, Darren Phillips from Southampton, out here? Um, I'm just curious what everybody's feeling is because you know. What we see out here is there's still travel things going on. We've got summer camps up with all kinds of activities happening, travel baseball, travel lacrosse, everything's going on. And I'm not sure what, what they're doing as far as cleaning stuff and guidelines. And then we have our kids coming in and trying to figure out how to keep them socially distant and wash everything and everything else after going through a summer of almost anything goes. So I just wonder what the feeling is out there with, with some of the stuff that's going on outside of school and how that affects in school. Yeah. Well, Darren, I'll, you, you know and I know, and everybody else on this chat knows, schools are going to be held to a higher standard. Public's going to look at us different. You know, when we get that case in schools, were we do, doing things properly? What were our precautions? And, you know, we'll get uh, scrutinized, scrutinized, but you're right, the travel leagues, the lacrosse, it's all going on. And what are the precautions? I can't imagine they're even close to what schools will be doing in, in, as we go back. And our coaches have been the last ones to be able to work with kids. And everybody else, you know, is out there doing everything. And we're still waiting for our coaches to get approved to, to work with kids. So it's just, a, it's just inconsistent. Yeah. No arguing that. When that first came, when that first came out, Darren, I was really frustrated, like like all of you. And then I decided, uh, you know what? Maybe I can contact our local youth groups, get their data, how many kids participated, how many games, and how many COVID cases, because that will be evidence for all of us. Most of us have interscholastics as well. That will be evidence that if it's even even though I don't agree with what they're doing, if we're not seeing a spike with those activities, why wouldn't we be able to do some things? And, you know. And I know we have a higher liability um, yeah. threat threshold, but my thought, pro I was really angry when that first started. Now I'm like, okay, how can we use that data yeah. to make our argument? Well, Brian, I think we already are seeing increases in cases throughout the state. Um, of what I, I think I'm seeing, and I'm studying the data every day and dealing with it on front lines, what I think I'm seeing is less deaths the percentage is at 10%, but I think it's slowly dropping. And I'm not sure necessarily what the reason is. It could be that they're starting to treat people more with antibodies uh, and plasma and stuff like that. But I think that's dropping, but it's still a lot. So, you know, when we think about the fact that we go to school, the other day I was watching the National Education Committee and one of the doctors said, you do have to understand 
I, I know everyone wants to get back to school. It's good for kids to get back to school and so on. But he said, you do understand that when you get back to school, you will get cases of COVID and it will spread through the school. And I think that that's, that's a key point. Um, I think some of the things that we're, we may not be in full control of is really going to direct how bad it will be. And that has to do with scheduling. How many school districts are looking at the fact of grouping 10 to 20 kids in one group? They stay together all day long. They don't go anywhere else. They don't move around. Possibly at the secondary level, they stay in a classroom and the teachers come in and visit them for most of the subjects instead of them moving around the hallways because in the hallways is where they're mixing. I think a lot of that is going to be on scheduling so that in phys ed, you don't have 300 one period and 10 another. You know, it has to be a small group that travels. They stay with those kids the whole time and they don't intermix because every person you meet, basically you've met every person they've met. That's how it works. So if you have 10 people in your group and they each meet 20 other people, then you're meeting thousands of people or hundreds of people. Um, so the group has to be tight. And then it gets even more involved when you start looking at having interscholastic teams after school. I'm going to I'm going to Clancy, Dr. Uh, Clancy Seymour's here and Clancy, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Your perspective and just comments for the group, if I could, I know I'm putting you on the spot. Uh, thanks, Ron. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, a special thanks, no problem at all. A special thanks to Ron and uh, Jim Rose and uh, uh, Jim Wright and Tam uh, for inviting me to, to join us today and, and be a part of the COA. I appreciate that. Um, it's nice to see a lot of familiar faces. Um, some uh, just, you know, kind of listening and hearing some perspectives. Uh, I received some guidelines from Maryland yesterday. Um, Reentry guidelines, much like uh, New York State and other states alike, and six feet is the number. So, you know, the question of 12 feet, where did that come from? I don't know where that came from, other than it was sanctioned by the New York State Department of Health. So that means we have to follow it. So, um, you know, I, I, you know, I'm impressed with what I'm hearing. Some great ideas. Um, and, you know, Ron did check in with me and Colleen yesterday in regards to, you know, what does that 12 feet mean? And, I, and to be quite honest with you, there's some language that says 12 feet for aerobic and everything else is left to interpretation. So I think all of you have it right. And as long as your administration and you being the, the focal points of that administration agree and come to consensus and you think yoga and table tennis doesn't qualify for aerobic and other activities do, then I think you're on the right track. Um, you know, I, heard, I was on a, a Zoom session yesterday with a higher ed uh, secondary PEAT faculty and uh, a discussion came up about sports like lacrosse and floor hockey uh, that use an instrument to implement a ball. The ball is never touched by the students. I thought that was interesting. I don't know how you figure out um, the distancing and the defense and offensive tactics that might go with that, but maybe you play three on ones and, and, and do that type of stuff and you're doing strategy where you're limiting uh, facing and that kind of thing when it comes to one-on-one uh, -on -one coverage. I don't know, but that's an idea that still white preserves some of the integrity of our invasion game units and in, in physical education. Um, I'm not sure if I've helped much, but uh, that's where what I'm getting. I, I, as far as I'm aware, uh, we're the only state that's imposing a 12 foot uh, uh, recommendation when it comes to activity. And again, don't mistake me being adverse to 12 foot being saying I'm not a, a for it or against it. If 12 feet is backed by science, that that's what's safe for our kids, then I, then I obviously support it. But I'm still kind of scratching my head about where it came from. Right. Thanks, Clancy. I know I put you on the spot. Clancy obviously is the president of New York State A for appreciate it. Tam, I'm going to go to you and then Brian, you're going to wrap us up. Tam, I always like to hear your words of wisdom. So I'll go to you and then Mr. Donahue. And I always think it speaks to your state in life that you think I have words of wisdom. <laughs> um, 
I, I, I appreciate this forum to hear everybody's ideas. Uh, we are doing what Jim said with that, the kids rotating or the teachers rotating to the kids. Um, you know, I, I think flexibility is the, is gotta be there. Uh, I think we've got to adapt on the fly. I think we have to reach out to each other. Uh, you know, it's going to be an interesting time. Uh, I do agree with Brian's comments about, I don't want to be, I want, I want to hold my kids as accountable as I can. And, but I'm going to try and temper myself and not be uh, a freak about it because I do understand that we have to be flexible, but I'm going to try and give my teachers the tools and the guidance and the professional development so that they can be better at distance learning because we're one of those districts where we're going to be hybrid and, and eventually we all may be distance anyways, but uh, we, we have to go hybrid because of size. But I appreciate the group wisdom and uh, thanks for hosting this, Brian and Ron. Thanks, Tim. Mr. Donahue, you're going to wrap us up, buddy. Hey, that's great, Ron. Thank you. Before we go, though, are there any final wonderings or questions? It's always helpful when people are thinking things that um, the rest of us aren't. So is there anything out there that we, we haven't covered that we should talk about before we, before we end? Hey, Brian, just one thing, if I may. Um, Clancy just made me think of, I think it was John Hitchway years ago. He used to do a lot of work with grids, or somebody did, grid spacing. You know, we all use that in coaching, but just a thought, if you taped your gym floors or your fields and painted them in huge grids, you know, where kids could do some kind of invasion game and work some skills, you know, but they had to stay within the grid. Um, you know, I, I just hadn't thought of that before at all, but you, you might have some success with that approach. That's it. Thanks, Jason. What, uh, Brian, if, if Brian, I just got one thing to add. This is uh, Steve Musso from Skinny Atlas. Um, one of the things that I, I think we have to deal with with our size, we're also going through a construction project. So we're less one gym, which is really hurts. Uh, we don't have an auditorium, that hurts. Um, we probably are gonna be doing phys ed in classrooms. Uh, and that's just the reality of it. So the teachers will be traveling to the classrooms. And we've, I mean, I threw this at my teachers. Uh, they, they, it's amazing uh, how brilliant some of these people are when they really sit down and, and start to think through a problem. And I think the consensus we're getting to is we are, we're, we are really not going to be fitness-based this year. It's just the reality of it based on the guidelines, based on, um, you know, the, the recommendations and the cleaning and all that stuff. There's just going to be less of it. When we can get outside, I think that's when we'll, we'll take advantage of it. Um, but for the most part, we're going to be in classrooms. Um, we're really, with our elementary schools, I think we can hone in on health. Um, our phys ed teachers can, can bring some of that stuff. So they can talk about proper um, hygiene. They can talk about um, stranger danger. They can talk about all these different components that make sense for a, a six, seven, eight year old. Um, we're gonna really concentrate on the social emotional piece. Um, you know, mindfulness, meditation, uh, those types of things. Um, you know, for kids that can handle it uh, the, at the other grades, uh, the upper levels, um, we're gonna look at exercise science, nutrition, um, biomechanics. And, and I think we're gonna be more focused on those things this year, knowing we're gonna be in a classroom most of the time. And I, I agree with Tam. I think at some point we're all gonna be online anyway. And help with that transition uh, to being online. Um, just if, I mean, just think about it. If you're a phys ed teacher, um, God forbid, winds up positive at a secondary level, your entire building's closed. And you know, how many times are we gonna close and reopen, close and reopen, close and reopen before finally the, the plug gets pulled? So I think the, the end of the day, we're gonna wind up online and, and that's where we're gonna, I think, concentrate most of our efforts in, in making um, our online program better, looking at expectations, looking at consistency, cross grade levels, cross buildings, um, and, and those types of things. That's sort of where, what we're thinking about in terms of um, PE. The other thing, I, I, the only other concern I have with us is just the contact time with our PE teachers. You know, our, our principals are scrambling. Um, we, we are, we're taking a K-7 in school every day approach and then 8-12 or hybrid. Um, and in order to make that work, um, you know, our specials unfortunately have been have been placed on the back burner. And, and so we're gonna have less contact time. Um, you know, my, my elementary uh, principal who was an ex-phys ed teacher basically told me yesterday, we may get one, 
one class a week PE. Um, you know, and I argued with them a little bit, but that's going to be the reality of it. In order to make this stuff work, um, it, there's just going to be so much less contact time. So I think someone mentioned about stretching things out. I think that's going to make sense as well. Steve, what I can't believe at this point in the in the this meeting, you're the first person to talk about being in the classroom. I thought that would be one of the first things. So it's going to be different in every district. I'm glad you brought it up because that's reality too, Steve. Fritz, do you have a comment? Yeah, and I stepped. I had to step away for five minutes, so I apologize if somebody else brought this up, but. Um, I was I was told that phys ed in our district would be the leaders in terms of teaching our students the proper techniques in hand washing and respiratory wellness. There is a mandate with COVID that that has to be a part of instruction. So we're uh, we're also taking the lead, even though it's going to be two lessons. It is something that we're going to lead throughout our district. Some of you may have already been asked to do that, or or will be asked to do that in the near future. Thanks, Ron. <laughs> Ron, if I could add really quick to that, I really want to just piggyback off of Steve's point, uh, an excellent point at that, that physical education includes physical activity, yes, and learning about movement, yes, but uh, it's also in and about and of movement. And I love the idea of what he mentioned. There are other parts of the world, uh, you know, me being a Canadian, we, uh, we, we take some different PE as well that has that critical pedagogy that gets into the classroom where you're not necessarily doing the traditional PE in the gym. And, and we can make PE meaningful doing those types of things where at the high school level, we're learning about social issues in sport. Like, for example, right now we're talking about uh, whether NCAA athletes get paid or not. We can have those discussions in, in high school PE and it can be a meaningful experience that learns about social issues with sport as well. So critical pedagogy could be our, could be our friend in PE right now. So I, I, I applaud what Steve's talking about. At the elementary level, obviously we have to refine it a little bit, but nevertheless, good points by Steve. Any other questions, concerns? Ryan, we're back to you, buddy. Before we leave, you know, I'm hearing a couple, couple themes that for the next meetings, First of all, thank you, everybody. I, I've got five or six ideas just from this hour, so I, I appreciate the, everybody sharing. We got to spend some time on virtual, helping each other with virtual. That's that's a pretty common theme uh, that's coming through, and I, I agree. We're going to be all virtual at some point. So let's let's meet in about two weeks if everybody's good with that. That at that point we'll know what the governor has decided. We'll all know our reopening plans. We could be a little more focused in terms of uh, our hybrid and our virtual model, and we'll have some other information. Uh, at that point. Is everybody good with that? Sounds great. Sounds okay. fantastic. So I'll schedule it two weeks from today if that works for everybody. And, um, you know, I appreciate everybody taking the time to be on. This has been awesome. Absolutely awesome. So, Ryan, thank you for uh, initiating, inviting us. And like I said, uh, you said two, two weeks from now, we'll get together. And I think we can have some specifics. If anybody has some concerns, you can email me anytime. I'll do my best to get you an answer and a response. Other than that, let's all have a great day and go get them. Thanks, guys. Good luck. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it.